Okay, so this is my first real video on this channel, aside from that little Crash 4 demo gag I did. And just to be clear, that's not what I plan on doing on this channel regularly. I just, that, I came up with that on a whim while I was watching everyone play the real Crash 4 demo. I'm going to try a variety of different things now, including reviews, which is what I'm going to start with. And I thought the best place for me to start would be to review all of the Naughty Dog games from Crash Bandicoot to The Last of Us 2. The only game I'm not sure I'll be reviewing on that list is Jack X Combat Racing, because I'm just not a huge fan of racing games. I don't think it's really worth reviewing for me. Uh, the reason I'm going with Naughty Dog is because I've played their games my entire life, basically. I grew up playing Crash Bandicoot, and in fact, it's the first game I can remember playing on my PS1, on my dad's PS1 back in the day. And uh, I never played Jack and Daxter growing up, but I've been playing them recently, and I'm about a fourth of the way through Jack 3 at the moment, so I will be reviewing those as well. I played the Uncharted games as a teenager, and I ended up playing The Last of Us as a young adult. Basically, the games grew up with me, and they played a part throughout my entire life. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before we get started is uh, for the Crash games, I will be using the remakes just because I don't have a capture card. I don't know how I'd record the original footage, but yeah, with that out of the way, let's just get on with the review. So since I'm pretty sure anyone watching this video is already fairly familiar with Crash, I'm only going to briefly talk about the history. So Crash Bandicoot was made during a time when 3D platformers were still a relatively new thing. This was Naughty Dog's first attempt at making one, and I would say they did a pretty great job, all things considered. This was the first time they gained a mascot that could compete with Mario, because before PlayStation didn't really have any recognizable platformer icons. This game is like Mario in a lot of ways, but I feel like it does enough to stand on its own and not just be considered a ripoff. While games like Super Mario 64 have a more open environment to explore. Crash Bandicoot takes a more linear route, which allows for denser details to create a deeper sense of atmosphere than you'd usually see in another platformer. The music in this game also contributes to how atmospheric it is, because it's mostly ambience, rather than in the sequels where the music is more recognizable and it's things you can listen to on your own. This game, I feel like the soundtrack is more to pull you into the experience rather than just to be listened to on its own. Because of this, I feel like this game has the strongest sense of atmosphere between it and its two sequels. This game also gives you the strongest sense of actually going somewhere. In the backgrounds of certain levels, you can see your destination off in the distance, which really just makes you feel like you're getting closer to it and actually progressing towards something. Also, making you do the levels in a certain order rather than using the warp room mechanic from the sequels really makes it feel like you're actually going from one place to another. These are what I consider to be the strongest aspects of Crash 1. Now this game is a platformer, so naturally I need to talk about the platforming. Now like I said, when this game came out, platformers were still a pretty new thing, and that really does show when you go back and play Crash 1 today. While I have a lot of nostalgia for this game, and I do really enjoy its gameplay, I do have to admit that by today's standards, it's a bit dated, and even by its two sequels. Crash's moveset in this game really is limited to just jump and spin. Even a non-gamer like Nathan Drake complains about Crash's lack of abilities. If you compare this to Super Mario 64, a game that came out the same year, you see that Mario is able to do things like double jump and triple jump with properly timed consecutive jumping. He can even ground pound, slide, and backflip. So what I'm really saying is that Elena should have had Drake play Super Mario 64 instead of Crash Bandicoot, because then he couldn't complain about Crash's lack of abilities, but rather his own, because Mario is a fat plumber and he can do more than they could ever dream of doing. Get over yourself, you cocky mother... Having all those mechanics that are easy to learn but difficult to master is the reason Super Mario 64 to this day has a very active speedrunning community. While Crash is a far more simple game as far as controls go, the platforming is still a ton of fun and actually takes a lot of skill to complete. It also takes a lot of patience. Anyone who's not experienced with this game will almost be required to take it slow. While I love that this game offers a great bit of challenge, I do wish it was a more steady increase throughout the game. You know how I said that this is the first game I remember playing? But well, what I meant was the first world of this game was what I remember playing, because my child itself could barely manage to get any further than that. This game goes from simple and easy to punishing very quickly, rather than slowly getting harder as the game goes on. Not only that, but the game also gets really easy once you get to a boss fight. A boss fight should be something that challenges everything you've learned in the game so far, but in this game... To be fair, that's certainly the easiest boss in the game, but they really don't get much harder than that. The only boss that I would say is somewhat challenging is the final boss, which I actually do enjoy, although that could be because he didn't have much competition. Alright, I'm back. Had to take a quick break to eat and take a shower. Anyways, back to what I was saying about the game getting hard a lot. So the difficulty spikes in this game wouldn't be a huge problem if there were a proper way of saving your progress. The only way to save your game is to collect three character tokens within a level. 
Collecting all three of any character's tokens will unlock a portal that'll bring you to a bonus round. These tokens aren't too hard to find, but the only issue is once you get to the bonus round, if you fail, if you die, you don't get to come back to that bonus round for that level. This means you don't get another shot at saving unless you get all three character tokens in another level. The thing that sucks about this is it really doesn't make any of the levels any more difficult, it just makes you have to replay levels that you've already completed. Playing through the game normally, these issues aren't too big of a deal because this is a difficult game, but it's not the most difficult platformer out there but these issues really do show when you're trying to 100% complete this game. Each level offers a gem you can unlock if you break every single box within the level, which sounds easy enough, but again there's a catch. If you die in a level, the game forgets all of the boxes that you've broken no matter how far you are into it. This means that you have to go through each and every level in one life. It doesn't help that some of the more difficult levels like Sunset Vista and Slippery Climb can go on for a really long time. I couldn't even attempt to complete this game as a kid, and even to this day I haven't except for in this remake. That's because the remake did fix a lot of these issues, but again I want to remind you I'm not talking about the remake, I'm just using footage from it, so get off my head. So completing the game 100% gives you the game's true ending, which is pretty cool. It shows you basically what happened with the villains after the story of the game. Still, I can say with certainty that if I had done it in the original version of the game, it would absolutely not have been worth it. Especially if you consider that the girl you were working so hard to save in this game never appears in the series again. At least not in the story. She becomes a playable character in games like CTR, or Nitro Fueled and stuff, but besides that she never shows up again. Anyways, I know it doesn't sound like I like this game very much because I've been spending the majority of the time pointing out its flaws. That's not the case at all though. I'm basically showing where there was room to improve so I can tell you how the sequels took what this game did and improved it. But to wrap things up, I want to say that even though this game doesn't have the best pace and difficulty or even a proper save system, it's still a game I often come back to for its engaging environments, its soundtrack that elevates the atmosphere, and its fun, albeit difficult at times, platforming. Having said all that, I think I'd have to give Crash Bandicoot 1 a 7 out of 10. So thank you so much if you stuck around through this whole video, and uh, if you enjoyed it, I'd be very grateful if you left a like. And I hope you'll join me next time when I review Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. Until then, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.